right. Uh, time to get started. So it's it's last session of the day. It's basically me between you and the party. So you know, um, <clears throat> it's gonna it's gonna be tough. Um, it's at least I guess for many of you, it's one of the first events after the pandemics, after the everything. So it's kind of very tempting to start with like, can you see my screen? Is my camera on? Is my microphone on? You know, all the things that we've been hearing for two years. Uh, but we're not going to do that. But we're going to do something else. So we're <laughs> speaking of, you know, technical checks. Up with your right arm or left or whatever. It doesn't matter. Both. Yeah, go ahead. Do it, do it, do it, do it. Do it, do it, do it, good. So now we know that those are working. Um, I will <laughs> ask you to use them. Because I have a talk, I have slides, I have material, but I really want it kind of to be, it's, it's the last session of the day, right? Let's make it a bit more interactive. There is no point of me just standing here and broadcasting for 50 minutes. We can, we can do things. So use your hands. Now, you know, now I know they're working. Um, use them, we'll send the mic around, you can ask, comment, you know, anything goes. Questions, feelings, comments, you know, anything. Crying about serverless applications, that works too. Uh, <clears throat> or cloud native applications. Um, all right, so what is a modern cloud native applications? There was a session a bit earlier by Holly that, uh, that she talked quite a bit about a lot of aspects of that. And this is going to be a little bit different kind of look at the same uh, thing, cloud native application. So um, this is a little bit of a, uh, of a um, retrospective, in a way, of the applications that were being asked to develop. I've worked for a uh, Norwegian consultancy company. We develop different applications. We uh, consult different kind of customers. They ask to do us, ask us to do different things. So this is a little bit of kind of you know, putting all together and th what makes a good application, what makes it cloud native, what makes it a good modern application, but also a little bit of, like I said, retrospective on, on, on all, all those kind of things. So when it comes to applications, what do they actually ask us very often to do most of the time? Um, typically, it would be two kinds of applications. So it would be um, an application as we know it. It could be like web app, mobile app, or you know, desktop app, whatever. Or it can be some kind of data pipeline because we need to process data and everything. So what things that will be different between those two would be that applications will be more concerned about performance, uh, UX, you know, make it useful, make it nice, make it pretty, you know, all those kind of things. And usability is an important thing, and so on, so on, right? Uh, with data pipelines, it's a bit different. You don't really care uh, about how it looks. There is nothing to look at. It basically chews data and spits something out. Uh, so the, here, you're more interested in how uh, how much time it uses to chew through that data, and how much data it can actually, you know, take in chunks at 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 a time. But so kind of different, right? S different, but still a little bit the same. So what is the same with those things usually is that um, they need to be scalable nowadays. I mean, we used to do things different. We used to do in the back in the days when, when I started working, when I started developing my writing professionally software, things were quite different. Now things, now we are more into microservices and all that, but we'll get back to to those kind of things. But the, the point is now, we want those applications, no matter if it is an application or a uh, data pipeline, we want to, be them, uh, to have them scalable. So they can scale up, they can scale down, they can you know, uh, respond to uh, the way things uh, change. This is five things that is a little bit of the why. I will explain why I called it the why, but um, you'll, you'll, you'll see it in a second. But for now, just, just, just keep it in the back of your head. So usually the things are uh, there for a reason. We want to have applications uh, quick and usable and everything for a reason. So you can call that a business needs, right? You have, um, you have an application and you want to be able to release that application as fast as possible to the market because, well, we've seen a lot of uh, cases where uh, two competing companies would 
kind of race to, 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 to release a service, one of them just manages to release it by a few days earlier, by a week earlier, whatever, you know, uh, and wins the race and everybody uses that and nobody knows what the other one actually was called a month later or something. Um, so ability to release things fast is an important thing. That's what businesses come and ask us. They were like, we want to develop this thing and we, and we want to, that to be able to be fast and have this short time to market thing. Another thing is agility. And ag by agility, I don't talk about like agile software development and all that. I mean, that's, that's fine, but this is not the thing I'm talking about. I'm talking more about the ability to respond to change. So it's kind of related to time to market thing. It's basically like when something new comes up, new functionality, new something you want to release, um, you want to be able to do that as fast as possible without taking down everything else. So like again, in the old days, when I started working around like early 2000s, we would have a service running on Tomcat and you know, new version, you take everything down, you patch it around, you deploy a new version, everybody's happy, you had a downtime of half an hour. It's kind of not really acceptable nowadays, is it? Um, <clears throat> so you need to be able to respond to change, you need to be able to respond to change in a graceful way, and there is a lot of aspects of that. So one of them is downtime, but also how do you add new functionality? How do you add some of these things to it? Um, another thing is, and it's kind of starting with kind of obvious ones and it gets into a bit less obvious ones in a way. Um, reliability is also relatively obvious thing that customers ask for, right? Obviously you want to have your app that is reliable. You want your app to be there for your users no matter what, rain or shine kind of thing. For that, you need a few things, right? You need to try to automate your things to make uh, things, uh, automate deployment, automate scaling, automate uh, health checks, you know, all those kind of things. So automation in many different ways, automate tests. Um, you want to make it scalable because you know, if, if, if you have one user, you want it to be able to respond. If you have uh, 100 million thousand users, you still want that thing to be able to respond. Maybe you will not have that amount of users, but that's a thing you need to think about uh, depending on your use case. If you're a tiny little startup, that probably not going to have that. That's totally fine. Don't think about that. But if you're expecting some kind of surge of users or something, or believe or wish or whatever, maybe you need to think about scalability. And then you have the availability, right? You know, is it going to be available? Is it going to be available nearby? Is it going to be available for that specific region in uh, in the world? I mean, it can be. Is it going to be a global thing? Is it going to be just for Europe, just for Americas? I don't know. Thing that you need to think about. The availability is a thing. And also, um, the, the next thing is res resilience. And by resilience, I mean, that's what, again, what would typically customers ask in one way or another, in different wording, but it always boils down to, you know, well, it needs to be fault tolerant. It needs to... Uh, to be able to behave uh, when something goes bad. And that's not, not, not always they actually ask, ask that. They just kind of assume that or they get really, really pissed if it's not there when you develop things. So this is kind of getting a little bit more obscure. It's kind of obvious when you see it on the list, but it's still a thing that you need to think about and you kind of need to expect them to, to, to be there. And by resilience, I mean a few things. So typically, fault tolerance is one thing. So if something goes bad, what, uh, what do you do? Do you do um, exponential backoffs? Do you, do, uh, do you have failovers? Do you have uh, some kind of strategy? Do you just you know, let your application crawl into a deep dark hole somewhere in the server and just lie there in, in, in like, you know, uh, just waiting for, for it to be restarted or you actually send a nice message saying, hey, sorry, you know, something went wrong where we're working in it, uh, just, just come back later. Um, observability is another thing and it's getting a bit more into 
things that we didn't use that much before, and but we're, it's getting normal, it's getting more useful. So observability is about kind of making sure that your application is actually doing fine before things go bad, before, so you can actually, you know, set up metrics, you can set up things, you can actually have a quick look at how your application is doing and how, um, you know, basically check the temperature of the whole thing. Is it going to be, is it going to blow up soon or we're good? And then you can do a lot of things with it. You can set up, you know, alarms and things and blah, blah, blah. But this is now, now we're talking about the business needs. Now we're, we're talking about problems, in quotes, uh, without solving them just yet. Security is an obvious thing. Security many comes in many shapes and sizes, but, you know, security to make them secure, um, you know, this re regular, you know, confidentiality, integrity, and, and availability kind of aspects of security. And the winner of the all uh, of the list is probably the lock-ins, and people go quite crazy about that. They talk a lot about lock-ins, and sometimes um, we work a lot with customers migrating, migrating to clouds, migrating to, to, you know, serverless applications, things like that. And then you would say, well, you know, you are moving to cloud X or cloud provider X. Um, why don't you use this managed service for the database for that from that cloud provider? Uh, no, we can't do that. Okay, what do you what do you want to do? Well, we're going to set up a VM. We're going to put Postgres on top of it, um, and we're going to run that. Uh, but, but, but you know. You're moving to cloud. You want to scale. That thing is not going to scale. No, no, but we, we don't want to do that because that is going to introduce lock-in if we're going to use the managed service. Exactly the same Postgres database managed just by somebody else. Uh, no, 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 we can't do that because it's going to be lock-in. And that's kind of really, 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 really bad misunderstanding of the whole lock-in concept. And if it sounds weird, Believe me, that, have has, that has happened. I've had that conversation. And it, it, it kind of, yeah. So um, lock-in is a very kind of misunderstood thing. Again, relatively obvious when you just sit there, it's like, pff, yeah, obviously we don't want to have a lock-in. But what, how do you define lock-in? Is, is like choosing if you're going to develop your application on Java or .NET. Is that lock-in or it's, lock-in when you choose a cloud provider, or is it lock-in when you use a specific framework for something, I don't know, for logging or for front-end or for whatever. So where is your actually definition of lock-in and where the, the boundaries go? So that's a kind of important thing to think. And usually the business needs part of this is kind of unclear, so you need to dig deeper into that. So this is what they usually ask us, right? And the what part, Again, you know, we've had the why, now we're going into the what, and soon we'll, we'll see why they're called, called that. Um, scalable applications. So scalable applications, what do we mean by that? Um, you can have them, they, again, they come in different shapes and sizes, but typically that would be something like, um, uh, something that can run on the cloud. And I mean can, not must. Not have to, but can. It can run on a public or a private cloud. It can be on a multi-cloud, and it can be a hybrid cloud. So, uh, well, public or private cloud is kind of obvious, right? It's a cloud service. It's there. It's running. We're good. Uh, multi-cloud is a thing that where you, uh, they might ask you again, the customers, and you know there might be needs for that. Uh, where you use separate uh, cloud providers for different things, or maybe even for the same things as a kind of, because you have super critical application, you really need to, um, to, to, for that thing to be available, and you don't really take a chance that anywhere, any, anytime, anything can go wrong, so you actually do like super uh, failover thing, running on two different clouds, you fail over if, if anything happens somewhere, you just go to somewhere else and all good and everything. And this is a very extreme case. Most of the cases, it would be some other reasons for that. It could be, for example, that you, 
uh, your data want to be pro pro processed somewhere or your applications want to be processed somewhere or a even more obvious reason for that would be pricing. Something is cheaper on one side and something is cheaper on the other side. So you kind of pick and choose. Um, last one is hybrid cloud and that is combining um, your own servers, your own racks, somewhere in your basement with some kind of cloud provider. And that is, again, a few reasons for that. A typical reason that we often see is some kind of thing that we're not allowed to send data somewhere. We're not allowed to ship data or our customer does not want to do that. Or it can be something like we have super special hardware. We have like super weird special application that does uh, something on GPUs. And those GPUs are impossible to get hold of in the cloud. So we need to buy them all, set them up, and use it on-prem. On and the other things will be uh, in the cloud. So that can also work like that. So scalable applications, they can scale and, again, can run on different clouds, but they don't have to. So now that we've had the, uh, those two parts, so we have a requirements from the customer and what usually, so why usually they ask for things and what they usually ask. Now I want to kind of take a step back and look into this cloud native thing that I kind of mentioned in the beginning and then partially forgot and didn't say much about that. So I give you a wall of text. And late in the in, in, in afternoon, um, this is a very, very bad thing to do. And I'm, uh, I'm very, I'm, I'm fully aware of that. And I probably lost you already to the wall of text. You're way into that text and reading that and parsing that thing. And you don't really even hear a word of what I'm saying. So to kind of let you, to, to snap you out of this thing, I highlighted a few words. To snap you out about, uh, from that thing even more, I removed some words. So now we're kind of having interesting, now it's getting a bit interesting. And if I click one more time, you kind of understand the what and the how uh, and why. We did not talk about, um, we talked about what, we talked about why. We did not talk about how. So this is kind of, as you can guess, that will be coming soon. But, you know, look, we are actually CNCF, cloud native definition. Uh, so CNCF stands for cloud native uh, uh, computing foundation. Um, <clears throat> and they say, well, we want to build scalable applications uh, that can run on pri uh, public, private, and hybrid or hybrid clouds. Um, we want them to be loosely coupled, resilient, manageable, observable, uh, with robust automation that changes frequently, predictably, with minimal toil. And uh, how do we do that? Well, you know, containers and service meshes and, and microservices and all this fun stuff. Um, declarative APIs and infrastructure and all that. So, I promised you five tips, and five tips really come in the part of how, because you know, uh, usually the the why is kind of given, uh, the what is kind of given, but you, it's up to you to implement things. And this is the how uh, part. This is uh, what this is kind of the, the, the five tips really. The the important thing to say. I'll go back so I don't lose you to that wall of text again. Uh, <clears throat> the important thing to say, because I showed you five things. I blinked on the screen. It will come back. Uh, but those five things can be implemented in any order. It does not have to be implemented, all of that. And it does not have to be implemented 100%. So again. You have all those five things. You can do a little bit of number one. You can do a little bit more of number four and do nothing about number five, and you're still good. The point is, it will make your applications a little bit better. It will move them a little bit towards the right way. And the other thing is that it's important to say, and I'll probably repeat that again and again and again, is that this is not a recipe for like super cool applications uh, and you don't have to do that all and some of those things or all of those things. You really, really, really need to ask yourself, why am I doing that? Why do I want things uh, being containers? 
Is it just because you know, everybody else is doing and I really want that to happen? Or is it because I really need that? Uh, is it because I have actual need to have loosely coupled microservice applications with service mesh and everything? Or is it because you know, everybody else is doing that? Because you're not everybody else. Your needs will be different. Your, uh, your, 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 your requirements will be different. And it's actually your job when, when you're asked by your customers your, uh, whoever is asking you to implement things as a developer, you kind of have to ask that question, pass it on, and ask, like, yeah, okay, cool, we can, we can, we can do microservices, but why do you really want me to do that? I mean, what's the point of that? Because sometimes people just do it just because, and that's probably a very, very bad idea, because you, you'll end up creating more troubles, creating a modern cloud native applications for no reason, spending a lot of time and then spending a lot of time managing them because it's not coming for free. So let's say loose coupling. Loose coupling is a very nice thing. We've been told for years and years. And it's like, ooh, you know, you can, you can create loose coupling. Then you can take down something and you can uh, take up something else. And you know, it's, it's going to be ma magnificent, maybe. But uh, with loose coupling, you have to think about architecture. You cannot just you know, throw things around. You need to think about things like APIs. And once you do APIs, how do you manage your APIs? And uh, then you, know, uh, you introduce microservices. And then those microservices need to talk to each other. So you have more APIs, more management of APIs. How do you version them? How do you do all that? Um, with all those microservices, they need to talk to each other. So service mesh. Ooh. Oh, yay. How do you manage that? How do you debug when something goes wrong? How do you make sure that you know, your microservice A uh, fails in a graceful way and microservice B does not go totally haywire because that one is down? And all those things, I mean, there is a cost for that. And there is a really kind of big cost for that because, well, okay, it's going to be pretty. You can take it down and redeploy and everything. But again, do you really need that? Do you understand me correctly? I mean, I love loose coupling. I love it, but like for its own use. It does not mean that you have to have that. Um, containers is kind of more or less, a little bit less no-brainer. You put them in the containers and everything. But then again, do you really have to put them? Do you, do you, do you have actual microservices or something worthy putting in a container? Or you're trying to shove a huge old monolith into a container, so it's basically finding a tiny little lunch box and trying to shove an elephant into it and then you know closing it it's like hey i have a container um, but well you know elephant is not really enjoying that container and that container is not really enjoying f hosting an elephant and you know nobody's really happy about that um, i kind of got the men mental image of an elephant in a tiny little container and that was um, that was kind of weird uh, <clears throat> but containers is is an important thing, and it's it's not just for things that you typically think about. It's 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 actually it's 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 a lot about predictability and predictable builds, so you don't have this works on my machine thing anymore, and predictable deployments because you know if if it works in on my machine on a container, if you have a similar architecture, a hardware architecture. Um, it's more most likely it, it's going to be really strange if it doesn't work on your computer on your machine or your servers and stuff, right? Uh, so it's about pred predictability of your both builds and deployments. Because back in the days, when I was writing my first lines of code, at, like my first year at work and stuff like that, we would write applications. We would write a long, and I kid you not, I mean, those documents were like several, like 20, 30, 40 pages long with deployment descriptions, like, you know, one, do this, two, download this package from, from this file server, three, unzip it, four, you know, put it there, uh, five, do like five prayers to make sure that it actually deploys, you know, and, and all, you know, it goes really, really long and really detailed. Now you don't have to do that. You just send a container or even Docker file possibly, and then you have a container registry somewhere and things are getting deployed and it's really, really nice. So predictable. But it's also portable. 
because you can actually, you know, lock, you remember that lock-in thing? You can actually, you know, if things are in containers, it's most likely that you will be able to port it from one service that can do containers to something else, maybe with some changes, maybe you'll need to do some changes, but those will be relatively minimal uh, compared to what we used to do with just installing things on right onto the hardware, onto, uh, onto operating systems and stuff, and having, again, those 40 pages long descriptions. That will take some time. That will take some trial and failure, and you know, it won't be possible to, or it will be very hard to automate. Um, speaking of automation, automate all the things. And it's not just like a funny uh, kind of uh, thing, like you know, all the things, something, all the things really try to automate all the things. Because um, we humans are kind of, we're, we're, we're very nice creatures, but we are, we tend to make mistakes. And we do that quite often. And we do that especially very often when things get boring. I mean, going through 40 pages document, installation guide, you fall asleep halfway, you go and grab coffee, you forgot which point you were on, and then you know you just move on, and then you make something wrong, and then you mistype something, and then you spend 300 hours trying to figure out that it was just a tiny little mistake in a config file. Um, with scripts and automation, that doesn't happen. It just goes quickly. It goes like every time it will be in the same way, and all those kind of things. So you save time. You get to do fun things. You can actually, I don't know, while it's being installed, you don't really even, if you don't have to work and, you know, you can just jump on a bouncy cancel and have fun and then come back and it's like, oh, it's working. It's actually deployed, right? Um, it's less error prone, which we talked about, about that, and it's less toil. You remember that toil thing in the description? Well, you know, automate as much as possible. Um, the next thing is, now it's getting, again, a bit more and more obscure, maybe. I mean, those first three things, it's more or less standard now. We kind of know that it's a good thing. We probably do that if for, for, for one reason or another, you know, and all that. Uh, resilience, it's, you know, it's sometimes it's a bit hard to, to make people do that and understand why do they need to spend money and time and resources of their developers to develop that instead of creating new fancy shiny features. Because, and that actually goes to a lot of things, especially automation, testing, you know, things like that. It's like, um, okay, so I have you as a developer uh, for a limited t amount of time, obviously, like say you're working for me for a year, I can use you for a year to develop new fancy features every time, every day or I can use you half of the day uh, or half of the time to developing something that my customers will never see and then use the other half to develop shiny features so I get half of the shiny features. So why would I do that? This is kind of the th typical thing that usually happens. So you need to really work hard to explain why that half of invisible work for external users is actually an important thing. It goes for automation, it goes for resilience. So um, with the resilience, how does like, I mentioned that a bit earlier, right? How does your application behave when uh, one of the microservices is down? How, may, how do you behave when something that's out of your control, some other service somewhere out there is um, not working properly, is returning something uh, or it's down at all or is just giving you some weird HTTP errors or whatever? Um, do you make your, your application observable? Can you actually, uh, do, you, do you expose some kind of metrics saying how well it's doing or how bad it's doing or how much memory or CPU or whatever, how many users it's using? Depending on what your application is doing, you might want to expose some kind of metrics. And if you do that, uh, you can again automate things, right? Because I did not mention uh, the K word here at all. Um, Kubernetes, <clears throat> because again, people do that for no reason. Because you know everybody else is doing that. That's like the that's the fashion now. Everybody like you know my Kubernetes is shinier than yours. You know and it's fantastic. I have 20 uh, nodes and lots of pods. And do, what do you use it for? Well, you know it just stands there. Um, so, but the thing is, if you actually have to run on Kubernetes or if you have to do serverless that we'll be talking in a bit about, you can actually use those metrics to scale things. 
automatically, right? You can actually make those things observable for a machine to know, oh, well, now it's things that are getting, getting a bit hot, so, you know, maybe we should spin up another uh, instance of that, or maybe we should spin down something, or things like that, right? Well, security is kind of obvious again. Uh, not going to talk about much about that, but then, you, you know, you need to protect your uh, endpoints, you need to protect your data, you need to do all that. But I mean, that's, that's a different kind of story. And then, and then there is this thing of serverless. And serverless is a kind of, again, misunderstood, uh, slightly misunderstood child of the whole thing. Uh, a lot of people think, first thing they think, that, oh, if I want to go serverless, I need to be on a cloud. Or if I need to go serverless, I need to have all these crazy things like loose coupling, microservices, blah, 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 blah. And it has to be like super fantastic. We need to have infrastructure as, uh, I don't know, a Netflix or Google has for my tiny little startup to, to go serverless. But you don't have to. That's the thing. Uh, you can actually experiment with serverless uh, without uh, doing things on-prem. Because serverless is not about, obviously, it's not about lacking servers, we kind of learned that after a while, but it's about lacking of this toil of configuring things or making things work. Um, so now you can actually run serverless. There is a Knative, there are some other things. That there are also uh, server different flavors of serverless. There were a few talks today that also discussed that. Uh, Meta had a talk where talked about like the serverless is not just functions anymore. You can actually do containers and things like that. So um, you can put your containers on-prem into something that will scale down and up and things without uh, thinking that you have a t only have to have a tiny little functions or you, 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 you really need to go to the cloud. Um, for the cloud, the answer is why is kind of easy. You save money, pretty much, right? If your cloud, if you're getting billed by amount of time your application runs, the CPU it uses, memory it uses, and so on, so on, so on, well, you know, you scale down to a very minimal amount or down to zero. Again, that's another kind of very hot topic. Should we go to zero or should we kind of minimize it? That's, that's, we can probably talk about that for an hour, but um, the point is, you will save money because you will be billed for less hardware being used. Uh, for your own on-prem thing, it kind of is true as well, but it's a little bit different way. In, in here, you don't have to scale for all of your maximum use of all of your applications when you buy servers. You can actually you know, share a little bit of hardware uh, between applications because typically your applications would be in, in different phases for different, uh, at, at, at the same time, right? So some applications might be used a lot, some others are not, then you kind of scale down something else, scale up something else, and then, you know, you go up and down. And then you save money, you save hardware, you save, uh, you don't have to buy, you don't have to um, create something, something, something uh, that will uh, be for the worst case scenario. Um, and then you can also obviously combine it with cloud so you can run things, everything on your own, and when the pressure gets too high, you can actually outsource some of it to the cloud, scale it up over there, and then scale it down when you don't need it anymore. Um, like, to give you an example why this is thing, so uh, in Norway we have this tax return thing, and uh, it, it, it mostly happens automatically, and then they just send you an email saying, hey, your tax return is ready, just go in, have a look. If it looks good, you don't really have to do anything. Uh, if it's not, you know, correct it, we'll fix it, and then we'll recalculate if you have to pay or if you get some money extra back or something like that, right? Uh, so what happens is, like, Norway's population is around five-something million. So you can imagine, well, how few millions of those are grown-up people paying taxes, so you basically, the tax office sending message to everyone is basically asking to DDoS them for, for a day. Because everybody gets a message in one day and everybody wants to check if they're going to get some money back. You know, it's super exciting. If you're going to get like 100 euros back, it's like, yes, I did it. In reality, it's still your money. You just paid too much. You just get them back, but it still feels good. Uh, but 
they needed to scale and they had a lot of troubles with this. They were trying to figure it out how to do that, how to, because they would end up buying hardware enough to serve five million people or well, maybe three million or two million or whatever. Uh, and that would be used for once a day or once, one day a year or maybe a week a year, right? So it makes no sense. So then you can actually do scale out to cloud. You can do some other things and everything. So. Uh, that is a little bit of the serverless. So these are the five things that you should try to see if they fit into your application. Do not do them, again, I will repeat it probably many, many, many times, but do not do them just because they were on the slide, just because I told you they're cool. You have to have a use case, you have to have a use for that, and then you can actually do that. Um, this is pretty much it, what I have of the uh, kind of, you know, my thoughts on, on, on what makes a good modern applications and how we can make them better. And it would be really nice to, to see if you have any comments, any questions, anything. You know, it's anything goes like from, well, this is wrong to this is good or, you know, I have this problem and somebody is uh, trying to stop me from solving that. I saw a hand over there, yes. So uh, you you mentioned the uh, scaling and uh, the 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 K word. Uh, it's <laughs> been haunting me recently uh, since uh, I, I've had a client who wants scaling. He, he just wants it. Mm -hmm. uh, do you have any tips on on how to justify the, this this scaling? So sometimes components, for example, a, a yeah. syncing component, it doesn't make sense for you to scale ten pods when you're trying to sync one thing. Uh, plus. Uh, any tips on, on how to avoid uh, the architecture, especially when the architecture yeah. is being built as we go? Well, um, that's a very good point. So I would say first question I would ask is like, uh, I mean, well, one thing, serverless, uh, no, sorry, uh, scaling does not equal or, I mean, it's not always connected to Kubernetes. You can run Kubernetes without scaling, kind of, or you can scale without Kubernetes also, kind of. But they, they are not like fully coupled. They're a little bit loosely coupled, if we can use the same uh, kind of way of thinking about things. But um, first, do you really need to scale? That I would ask. I mean, I, I know that you're kind of probably I can guess what you're thinking. But so you ask the customer, like, do you really need to scale? Do you have a fluctuations of users or you have a standard kind of pretty much same load all the time? Uh, that's one thing. Number two, uh, when you scale th things, do you really need, um, is it, I mean, do you have enough load to justify using Kubernetes? Uh, Kubernetes is good and everything, but you know, it's still, uh, at least three or four virtual machines, pretty beefy virtual machines, typical setup, right? Three nodes, master, and you know, or main. Now it's called, I think. Uh, but but you know, um, do you need all that machines running 24/7, producing a lot of heat and and you know, using CPU because it's quite intensive. Do you have enough users to do that? I did the same mistake. I put a tiny little application that we were using for roughly for like a two months a year on a three node Kubernetes cluster. It was really fun. We made it work, it amazingly worked just like a charm until we forgot about it for like two months and then the bill came in. It was exactly the same thing that Holly told like just a few hours later. I got a bill for, it wasn't that bad, but I mean it was just like a few hundred euros a month for nothing. I mean, people used it for two, two months and then they haven't used it, but it's been 200 euros every month. Do you really want to pay that? So you kind of need to um, visualize and make, them, make all those things visual to, to the customer and see what they actually, I mean, if they, if they don't care, that's fine. Then you need to talk about some other things. Do you want me to spend my time making that application scalable uh, without being without it being useful, or do you want to spend 
say, I don't know, a thousand uh, euros or 500 euros a month on a cluster that idles most of the time. Or maybe, maybe they have a really good use case for Kubernetes. Maybe you can actually do a Kubernetes and then install uh, uh, Knative on top of that and do like serverless thing and can actually share it between different applications and, 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 and use that. Or, just use Kubernetes for, for that, for sharing between different applications and everything. But then, you know, it, it brings a lot of comp complexity, it brings a lot of networking, br brings a lot of security, brings a lot of those things. Do they really want to spend time? You kind of say, well, you know what, in making that application scalable in this way will cost you that much. Buying another server and scaling horizontally and satisfying all your needs will cost you 10 times less. Which one do you choose? I can do both. You know, and then it, it depends on really on the case. I mean, it's, it's not the answer you probably want to hear, but usually it depends. But uh, try just to, 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 to see if there is actual use case for that and see if you can convince them. And usually it's like showing value is uh, the way to convince in a positive way, to ask, to, to make them go over to something, you do a tiny little bit by tiny little bit, and then they see value and see a return of investment, and they kind of, they want more and more and more. For the opposite, then maybe you need to kind of visualize the whole cost and say, hey, this, this is what it's going to cost you roughly, plus this management, plus if you're going to run Kubernetes on-prem without using a cloud, you have to have an ops team that will do all this because we need to handle certificates, we need to do the networking, we need to do someone, you know, um, kicking a rack of servers when they're not working properly and just make them blink again, and you know, all these kind of things. And it's like, and, and, and this and that, do you really want to do really all that? Or we should don't do that. Or maybe we should move to cloud and use managed Kubernetes servers, right? I hope it kind of answers you, uh, at least points you in the right direction. Uh, and we can talk more about that. Any other questions, any other kind of frustration, like, you know, anything? Because when I do this, this kind of talks that they're not like heavily technical, I've been asked to keep it without too much of tech, without too much of a platform because of the track we're in. Um, usually people ask, like, how do I do something? I have this problem, how do I solve it? And this kind of thing. So it's okay to ask this kind of thing. It's really, it's really fun, actually, to see. I mean, it's not, it's not fun to see the suffering, but, you know, it's fun to solve and help people. <laughs> Anyone? Yeah, I guess, I guess everybody is very ready for a party. Yeah. All right. Well, if there is anything, this is how you find me on social media, you know, on Twitter. Find me, uh, ping me, and we can, we can talk more. My, my DMs are open. So thank you all for coming.